Thank you all for signing on. I look forward to doing this um, presentation for a while. And then just today, just today, some very important data came in. <laughs> so I was crazily redoing the slides just in time for tonight, which is probably partly why I'm frazzled. But anyway, so again, welcome and let's get started. So as you can see from the title, you know, we have patients who are chronic tick-borne disease, Lyme type patients, and we have COVID patients, and sometimes the two intersect. So the question sometimes is, well, if this person has what looks like they post-COVID syndrome, a long hauler, how do we know that's what it really is? Is it possible that their tick-borne disease is reactivated? So let's see what I can do. I can't get another slide here. Hold on. Okay. So um, this is just a quick outline, some basics of COVID some basics on post-COVID plus the clinical findings that kind of are surprising. Um, with that in mind, I wanted to compare and contrast COVID, especially post-COVID and chronic tick-borne disease manifestations, go over the lab testing, and then go over the breaking news, which has to do with documenting COVID immunity. Very big topic that pretty much has been not discussed yet because we didn't have information or data, but now we do. So we'll go through the testing also then for tick-borne diseases, then a question I pose, which also has not been discussed is, if you have a chronic patient and you're not sure whether it's post-COVID, post-tick-borne or both, can you do a therapeutic challenge? What about giving them some kind of treatment and seeing what happens? So that's hopefully interesting to all. Let's try it from the beginning. Okay, basic COVID. There are three phases. Sometimes none of them happen. Sometimes some of them, sometimes all three, but it starts as a virus. Um, then there's the inflammatory phase. People talk about cytokine storms and so forth. It doesn't have to get that bad, but there's definitely an inflammatory phase. And then there's a phase that follows, and that's immune compromise. Um, sometimes this immune compromise can be incredibly severe and that can add to the chronicity. In acute COVID, um, there's inflammatory and autoimmune features as well, which means cytokines, chemokines, and complement cascades activating. Also, there's vasculitis of small and large blood vessels. It turns out that endothelial cells carry ACE2 receptors, so it kind of makes sense. Another thing that's really interesting and unusual is there's intravascular thrombosis in arteries and venous system too. So that's really unusual. These can be microscopic, microemboli, can be macroscopic. Apparently, platelets can be activated not only by the cytokine cascades and by the, uh, the vasculitis, but also because megakaryocytes can carry ACE2 receptors as well. And finally, the metabolic damage, the mitochondrial membrane damage, cell membrane damage, the cell danger response activates, and then we have chronicity. And after the acute phase, depending on how bad the illness was, there can be residual fibrosis and scarring, which obviously you can imagine. So post-COVID syndrome, this is a prospective study very recently published by JAMA. Overall, 32% of all people, all people who got COVID have symptoms lasting more than six months. This is another one. 12.5% of those who did not even have symptoms of COVID had what they call a, quote, decreased quality of life. Now, in Italy and China, they have statistics on the long-term patients who are seriously ill and who are hospitalized. Italy, the statistic is 76%. China, 87% did not come back to normal, had persisting symptoms post-discharge. So here we're talking about overall 32% of people. That's a huge amount. Now look at these clinical things. Fatigue, decreased stamina, headache, body aches, cognitive impairment, conjunctivitis, neuropathy, depression. I mean, it starts to sound a lot like our tick-borne diseases, doesn't it? Um, sleep difficulty, GI symptoms, um, difficulty breathing, the sense of smell and taste that can be lost, we've, we've all heard about. New symptoms can happen that are not on the list, and that can vary person to person, it can be hair loss, rapid heartbeats, anxiety, and so forth. All right, so the question is, could some of these symptoms actually reflect a reactivation of tick-borne diseases? Well, both are chronic, both are multi-system, and immune compromise that can result from either one can allow latent infections to reactivate. Now look at this list, symptoms common to both. Let's just talk about commonalities first. We've got fatigue, headaches, arthralgias, myalgias, cognitive deficits, sleep problems, palpitations, rapid pulse. Then we talk about sweats, chills, shortness of breath, cough and dizziness, then conjunctivitis, GI upset, anxiety, depression. Now it's tricky here. Look what I did. The first column, the fatigue, headache, arthralgias, that's 
the things we commonly associate with Borreliosis. The next one sweats chills, short of breath, cough, and dizzy. Sounds a lot like Babesia, doesn't it? Last column, conjunctivitis, GI, anxiety, depression. Again, it starts to sound like Bartonella. And of course, none of these are, exact, are absolutes, but it starts to get you thinking that, hey, you know, maybe some of this post-COVID really could be reactivation of our tick-borne diseases. Now, I made this table, and it's not important to go through it line by line, but just to give you the idea to start thinking this way, when you have a patient with these chronic symptoms and they're labeled post-COVID, but maybe the tick-borne disease, this kind of an assessment can help you decide um, what type of assessment or testing you want to do. Okay, so those are symptoms. What about signs common to both? Not every patient will have these, but they can be fever. You can have false positive ANAs, so you can't say, well, it can't be Lyme because it's this, or you can't be COVID because it's that. False positive rheumatoid, antiphospholipid antibodies, activated cytokines, abnormal brain scans. MRIs and specs will be abnormal because of the vascular compromise in both illnesses and neurologic problems. And possible cardiac and even pericardial involvement. I'm going to talk more about this a little bit later on. So how do you differentiate the two from a clinical point of view? Well, some basic things, nothing absolute, but chronic Lyme, you know, you want to start with a history of Lyme or at least a history of possible tick exposure followed by an illness. The thing that Lyme and the tick-borne disease is related to it, the symptoms are migratory and the symptoms are cyclic. They come in the four-week cycles, three-week cycles, the things that we're so familiar with. And of course, when you do testing for tick-borne diseases, they might be positive or just very suggestive. When it comes to chronic COVID, of course, there's a history of prior COVID, maybe. <laughs> Some of these people are not symptomatic, but they become chronically ill, as you saw the 12.5% from the JAMA article. The symptoms here, though, don't migrate. They don't cycle. So that's a big tip-off right there. And then end organ damage. You know, there's potential for end organ damage in COVID that you really don't see, at least not commonly, in the tick-borne diseases, such as renal failure, hypoxia abnormal chest X-ray with scarring and so forth, ground glass infiltrates, and these intravascular clots, which can be widespread, small and large. But here's the kicker. A patient could have both. Let's say someone who has a history of tick-borne diseases gets COVID and they start to recover from the COVID, but not completely. They're really starting to be chronically ill again. Well, they could have some post-COVID syndrome, whatever that is we'll talk about, and reactivation of the tick-borne. So then here we go. We've got to figure it out. So start with, we'll look at the time course. The vertical dotted line is the onset of symptoms, generally thought to be five to seven days after exposure. So we'll start the blue solid line. That's when you can detect the SARS RNA in the bloodstream, PCR of course. And you see that before symptoms start, it's not a very long time before you start to see the positives, but there is a time when you don't have a positive. And this makes me wonder why are people who are asymptomatic getting screening PCRs to see if they can visit their relatives. I mean, sometimes that doesn't make sense. All right, so anyway, by the time symptoms develop, the likelihood is there that you will have a positive PCR. But now look at this. Within a week or two after the onset of symptoms, which is two to three weeks after the onset of infection, the PCR um, result or the RNA in the blood that you can detect starts to go down very quickly and it gets very low. It doesn't get to zero which you know, we'll talk about, but it does get down very low within just a few weeks. So what's left? Well, the dotted lines talk about the antibody response. And you'll see the dotted line that's gray, that's IgM. Again, maybe a week to two weeks after onset of symptoms, which is two to three weeks after onset of infection, you'll start to see a detectable IgM response, which rapidly falls off. Here, the IgG in orange picks up about a week or so later, will peak and it also falls off. Now this one study went out to about six weeks and I have data now to talk to you about longer term um, IgG levels. So what about the laboratory testing for COVID? Well, there are tests for COVID and specifically the test for the SARS-CoV-2 virus. And there are also tests for the damage that may result. So in the case of late stage or post COVID or long haul or whatever you wanna call it, you have two basic options, the serology and the PCR. Serology, when you do that, um, for a lot of reasons, which we'll go over in great detail, the immunoblot for SARS-CoV-2 is preferred, way more preferred over the serology. 
A PCR, very low yield. You may still need to do it just to be complete, but the yield is still going to be low in a chronic person, usually. Then, of course, you can measure arterial oxygen level, chest X-ray, renal function, ferritin. You may want to consider a pulmonary stress test. Now, if someone has microemboli or scarring in the alveoli or in the lung vasculature, the, alve the uh, capillaries, you know, at rest, they may not desaturate too badly, but give them a, a pulmonary stress test. And as the demands increase, they may really can't keep up. And then you'll see the big changes. Consider a cardiac evaluation. Now, this I wanted to talk about. People often do an, an echo to look for low ejection fraction, but much better test. And what I really recommend you consider doing is a cardiac MRI. Now, as I was preparing this data, I was astounded to find that cardiac involvement in COVID is incredibly common. One study, I'll give you an example. They studied college athletes who had mild COVID. They were not hospitalized. They were not terribly sick, but they had to be out of the game. After the symptoms had cleared, they did um, cardiac MRIs. Over 40%, I think it was 42%, had myocarditis on the MRI. 42%. Now, myocarditis, besides potential for cardiac damage and insufficiency later on, don't forget, myocarditis can be a cause of sudden death. So what the MRI can show you is some very interesting things. It can show health of the myocytes. It can show inflammation in the heart. It can show edema in the heart. And by looking at global function, it can tell if there's a depression, if it's from depressed from myocardial inflammation, which is global, or focal ischemia, as you would get from having a clot thrown. And that would show focal um, poor wall motion. So the cardiac MRI can be very valuable. And also, you know, you can use it in follow-up to see how the patients are doing if they're healing well. I talked to you about the PCR. This kind of relates to that slide I showed you with the graph. The PCR is not a very sensitive test. It's mainly meant, it was really designed for quantification of the viral load. It's not meant for firm, fine diagnosis. For that you need nested PCR, which is prone to false positives sometimes. So this is what we have. Again, this comes from an annals study, 100% false negative on day one of infection. You saw the graph, there's nothing to show. By day four, which they call the day before the symptom onset, two thirds had a false negative. Even by the day of symptoms, 38% had a false negative. Only by day eight and nine did they have the best results. 20 to 21% was still false negative though. Uh, by day 21, two-thirds were false negative. So they claim, and wish they said this about Lyme, if the clinical suspicion is high, infection should not be ruled out on the basis of the PCR alone. So again, what this means is that it's really not the kind of test you want to do or can do in a chronically ill post-COVID patient. It's not gonna be that high of a yield. So we come to the antibody testing. Again, from the graph, about two weeks after exposure, a week or so after the symptom onset, you start to get an IgM response. It'll persist for about six weeks, perhaps a little bit longer. IgG response appears one to two weeks later after the IgM, also will persist for several months and decline. The decline actually is, early, is more rapid. It declines earlier in the elderly population. Now, what about false positives? With standard serologies, that's always an issue because 40% or so of common colds are actually coronaviruses. And maybe there's some cross reactivity. On the other hand, you can get false negatives because think about it, you have to turn down the test sensitivity to not have these false positives. And that's the usual trade-off with these low-level tests between sensitivity and specificity. So the answer obviously has to come somewhere. And um, one great answer is the immunoblot, which we're gonna talk about. This is an Igenics exclusive. It's like a Borrelia immunoblot. It uses multiple antigens. They're recombinant antigens, so they're very, very pure it drastically increases specificity. And what's very important is that you're not just looking for a protein and antigen. This includes S1 and S2, which are two different spike proteins, and the nucleocapsid, the RBD, which is the, um, the binding domain. So you have four different antigens that are tested on the immunoblots. So this gives you far less concern for unwanted cross-reactivity with other coronaviruses. And because you have these different bands that you can look at, you can distinguish on a positive immunoblot, whether that's positive because of an mRNA vaccine response or whether someone actually has virus-induced immunity, natural immunity or RNA vaccine-induced immunity. I'll show you an example of that shortly. Now, the sensitivity also is far better because of the recombinant antigens. 
Now look at this. These are actual immunoblots um, of SARS-CoV-2. Look how beautiful that is. Did you ever see a Western blot, for example, look this clean? I mean, here, I don't wanna go through all the details for time reasons, but any place we expect a positive IgM, be it controls or early patients, you get a positive IgM. Places you expect a positive IgE, you get it. Places you don't expect those, you don't get it. Um, and here, look, there are four different controls in every strip, plus the three different test antigens. Really elegant, elegant test. And unlike a Western blot, there's no confusion which band is which. You know, they're not all blurred together because they're specifically placed on the, on the gel. So what about the sensitivity? 84 samples from 37 patients. These patients were followed prospectively from the onset of their illness and the positive PCR. Um, most of these people tested on a weekly basis, and this is where the results came from. If you look at only the IgM, the sensitivity is 70%, specificity 95%, with a positive predictive value of 93. If you look at IgG only, the sensitivity is 92%, specificity 99%. You're not going to be finding common cold coronaviruses here. Now, if you combine the two, if you find either an IgM or an IgG, and I'll show you in a second why that's a reasonable thing to do, here you have a sensitivity of 97%, specificity 98, positive predictive value of 90, negative predictive value of 100%. So this is what I was talking about, why um, looking for IgM and IgG together makes sense. So the orange bars are patients who have only a positive IgM response. And you see each group of columns go for patients zero to 10 days out from positive PCR 11 to 20 and so forth. So as you expect early on, a small percentage, maybe 50%, will have already an IgM response. Um, by the third to fourth week, days 21 to 30, very few people have only an IgM response and nothing after that. Look at the green bars, the IgG. So here, also day zero to 10, about 15 to 20% already a positive IgG. Now, let me go back a second. IgG sensitivity, IgG alone is 92, but the specificity is 99%. So these people are already developing IgG within the first week of the infection. Or I should say first week since a positive PCR. It's possible they had an infection a week or two by the time the PCR was done and results came back and so forth. But still, an early IgG response is possible, but you need an immunoblot to find it. Now, if you look at the purple bars, IgM and IgG, and then the blue bars, IgM or IgG, you see that IgM will go on and persist for as long as 51 to 65 days. We're still seeing positive IgMs. So only when you get out to 100 to 125 days so this, does the IgM disappear. Then it makes you think, you know, when we see our tick-borne patients who have a positive late IgM, we think, you know, these people are probably still infected, something's still going on. Either that or the immune system is so damaged they just can't convert. Um, from IgM to IgG. Well, look at this might be the same thing going on. Also makes you think maybe these are the patients who might have a tick-borne disease that blocked that conversion of M to G, which does co hold for other co-infections when the Borrelia are present. So very interesting data that came out. Now, how do you document COVID immunity? This is a question that, you know, it's a big question I mentioned in the introduction. Now, how do you tell? These are the questions people are asking. Do all people mount an immune response? If you've had COVID, are you immune to getting it again? Some get it a second time. What does that mean? How about vaccine-induced immunity? How does that compare to natural? Is it better? Is it not as good? How long does a natural post-infectious immunity last? How long does vaccine immunity last? Is there a way to test for a person's immunity? Well, as you can imagine, I have an answer that's yes. This is the big news of the night. So B-cell immunity, we have the immune blot individually test for these four separate antibodies, spike, the re receptor binding domain, and the nucleocapsid, the S1, S2, and in RBD. The new test, brand new. Tonight is the first time it's been announced, so you all people are, all you people are starting to hear something brand new. It's a T-cell immunity test. Now, you know, from the very early days of COVID, antibody testing was started, and people were saying, well, that's well and good, but the truth about Immunity is you got to see what the T cells are doing. T cell immunity may persist after B cell immunity. You can have zero negativity, but a T cell memory and so forth. How do you know? Well, now you can. T cell testing is now being researched at IGENIX. It's a standard LA spot. It's for the SARS CoV 2 virus. Um, it's being researched. The data is, it's been researched. The data is being collated now. And hopefully within a few weeks, we'll be able to make some announcements. 
And if so, we'll probably have another webinar. So please stay tuned. Now, what about these preliminary results released today, just a few hours ago? What this represents is a serial study of the immune response after natural COVID infection, and also what happens after mRNA vaccine. After the natural infection, the antibodies to the S and the N antigens disappear after just a few months. The RBD doesn't last even that long. After the vaccination with an mRNA vaccine, which is all we have here so far in America, Immunoblast shows that not every patient develops antibodies even after the second dose. Now, in terms of the specific numbers, they're just being analyzed right now, so I'm not going to give you those numbers. Stay tuned for our next webinar. The early spot, which is a T-cell test, showed that even six weeks after the first vaccine dose, less than half showed a T-cell response. After the second dose, several more patients converted on the early spot, but there still were some patients who did not show T-cell response. So... What does that mean? It means now we have the tools to answer those basic questions. As I answer them, go back one. Um, do all people mount an immune response? Well, maybe not. Um, does a vaccine immunity compare to natural immunity? Well, we have data. We're going to analyze it and let you know. How long does it last? Is a way to test the immunity. So these are the questions that are now being answered based on this new technology. So what are the implications? One is that immunity might not last a long time. There are people who Last year in January, February had COVID, complete symptomatic, zero positive, PCR positive COVID. And after five months or so, their immunoblots were negative. So again, am I immune? Did the vaccine work? Will boosters be needed? If so, when? If the vaccine, should we give it to someone who already had COVID? How do we know? Are you risking of giving them a bad vaccine reaction if they don't need it? Well, finally, these conundrums can be answered. So stay tuned. All right. So I talked about COVID in the post-COVID person. What about the tick-borne diseases in these, this group of people? What do you do? Well, obviously, we know about the wide variety of tick-borne diseases that can be present. So it's not just Lyme Borrelia, but it's a lot of them. And based on the symptom pattern and your knowledge of the patient, you may have to test for multiple. Now, again, late in the infection, testing is difficult because often the immune response is compromised, but also at the same time, the pathogen load is low. So to get the highest yield, you really have to do both the direct and indirect test. What does that mean? An indirect test is a serology, a T-cell assay, that type of thing. And a direct test is something like a PCR or a fish um, culture, something that's a direct test. Now, why is that important? Perfect example, I've talked to you about this before. Internal study of babesiosis, adding serology to people who are direct test negative increased the positive yield by 12 and percent. So even here, with two really good direct tests, the FISH and the PCR, there still are patients that are missed and you have to consider adding a third test. Another problem, biofilms are most likely present in the chronic tick-borne disease patient. And this can affect your testing choice and test sensitivity because this may impact whether direct testing and even indirect testing will pick up the bacteria. We're gonna start you know, illness by illness, just go through the, main, the, the few main ones. Starting with Bartonella, indirect testing, the IFA is old technology, it's only Bartonella Hensley, so don't even waste your time. You need to do a Western blot, it's a genics off disease. And that's been designed to detect multiple species and it's far more sensitive than the IFA, so basically it replaces it. All you need to do to have a positive is two bands, two or more bands, so it's very clear cut. And now if you want to do a T cell response assay, for example, the IGX spot, which is an LE spot for this, that's something you may want to consider doing in someone whose B cell function is impaired, if they're IgG deficient, you might get a false negative on a serology. When it comes to direct test, the FISH test is available for Bartonella. And the advantage of this is that it's genus specific. So you're going to get a wide variety of species coverage on that. The other advantage is that, and this is a, a characteristic of FISH technology in general, discovered back in the 90s actually, that it can detect organisms that are embedded in biofilms. Therefore, for Bartonella, it's the most sensitive direct test currently available. Bartonella, as you if you haven't seen it, they make monstrous biofilms, even in the vascular space. And um, you need a test that'll break through that. Another direct test is a culture-enhanced PCR. The yield is still low. You need multiple samples. And what you do is the blood is collected, it's cultured, and over time they're pooled and PCRs are done in an effort to amplify the result and get a better yield. Yield is still very low. A new technology is the droplet digital. EPCR, basically it's a PCR, but they use novel technology 
to increase the sensitivity by breaking up the blood into very tiny little bubbles, little tiny specks of blood and doing PCR on each of them. But the problem is we don't know if this will detect organisms trapped in biofilms. It was never addressed in their, in their papers. Um, also, you need several sequential blood samples. And even here in their own paper, they didn't get 100% pickup. So yes, it's something that is out there and you may have to do several of these to get a good answer. So the recommendation because of low test sensitivity and because of the chronicity and maybe low immune response, low viral or bacterial load, I should say, is you wanna do a combination of direct and indirect tests. The best direct test right now is the fish. The best indirect is the Western blot to maximize not just sensitivity, but species coverage. Now you can substitute a PCR for the fish if that's what you have. Likewise, if someone is markedly IgG deficient, a T cell response assay, the IgX spot, can be done in place of the Western blot. Now, Babesia, again, multiple species. The two dominant ones are Microti and Duncani. Um, Duncani was also known as WA1 back in the old days. And it was called WA1 because it was first discovered in Washington state. But the thing is that it's now been found to exist across the entire United States. So you can't say, well, the person's in New Jersey, I'm not gonna test a WA1 or Duncani. Not true. It's found all across the United States. In fact, other species occasionally show up. So you wanna have a test that's broadly sensitive to different species. But there are testing limitations with Babesia. It's a parasite. Not everybody has enough parasites in the blood to, for them to be detected. Not everyone will become seropositive. Not all labs can detect multiple species. So here, false negatives, unfortunately, are very common. But the other thing, though, the flip side is it's very rare. I think it's almost never seen to get a false positive, at least not in the United States patients. So what that means is that, for example, when I'm ordering Babesia testing, if I can, I'll get all three. I'll get the fish get the PCR, I'll get the serology. And if any one of the three is positive, I believe the positive over the negatives. So again, multiple testing is kind of the way you have to go with Babesia right now. In testing someone with post-COVID chronic disease, what are the options? Well, a stained blood smear is only useful within the first two weeks of infection. So it's not even worth doing in a late stage patient. The fish, as I mentioned, is genus specific, offers broad species coverage. Um, far more sensitive than a smear, is useful in the chronic disease, therefore. And just so you know, it is um, approved in New York State and they actually scored 100% on New York State validation testing, which is kind of unheard of, but it's good to know. It's also good to defend yourself if someone criticizes you for ordering these tests. The serology, the IFA that Igenix offered is designed to be broadly reactive for multiple species, as is the PCR. So here the recommendation, as I said, you've got to do all three if it's affordable. You just have to do them all. Now, Borrelia, we know about this. We've talked about this many times. There's so many different species out there that to just test with an ELISA for B31 lab strain is, is, is old. You don't do that. Especially since over one quarter of clinically diagnosed Lyme patients didn't have Lyme, they had tick-borne relapsing fever because apparently there's an overlap in their presentation. And again, a couple of series, we've seen this before. One series from one doctor's office, 36 Lyme cases, they found Mayonii, Spilmanii, Californiensis, Gaminii, Abzalia, Valsiana, and B31, and some they couldn't even speciate. So here, you're finding that it's Borrelia burgdorferi sensolato, not just B31 sensostricto. So you have to have broad coverage on your testing. And for tick-borne relapsing fever, again, another series from another doctor's office, 48 cases. They found Hermzeri, Miyamotari, Toracate, Tricicolae, and a whole bunch of cases that couldn't be speciated. Well, what does that mean? When you're doing a test like an immunoblot, you can't speciate it. It means either one of two things. Either there are several different species present and the banding on the immunoblot is just very full and they're not willing to call it, but they know that they're there. Or it means that maybe you have some others that haven't been um, reported on immunoblot, such as maybe Park Rye, Texas Census, other different um, Borrelia. So, the point, though, is that if you have a positive that's unspeciated, it doesn't mean it's nothing. It means that you have something there. So it has to be broad. Now, none of the IFAs, ELISAs, Western blots, PCRs, urine tests, T-cell tests have ever been validated for sensolato for the broader group of Lyme Borrelia. None of the IFAs, ELISAs, PCRs for tick-borne relapsing fever have been validated for all those other different species. So you have to you know, find tests that offer broad coverage. Agenix offers immunoblots, as I showed you, multiple antigens, multiple species, Lyme and tick-borne relapsing fever is available. Now, these are two separate tests. It's important to know that there's no overlap. 
if you have a Lyme patient on, who doesn't have relapsing fever, you're not going to get a false positive relapsing fever immunoblot and vice versa. So they are very specific for those groups. As I mentioned, usually you can identify species unless you have multiple infections at once, which has happened. And really, you know, it replaces the Western blot. It just gives you more species coverage and better information, more sensitive, more specific. They also offer what's called a broad coverage assay. Um, if it's a matter of affordability, this basically replaces the ELISA. And yes, it will look for these various species, but it's very simple. It says yes or no. You have a, yep, they were found or they weren't. You just can't speciate it. So if you want to have the better information, you want the immunoblot, but finances are a problem. Broad coverage assay is a reasonable replacement for the ELISA. I mentioned that um, if you're going to do PCR, you want to have one that's broadly specific and also very sensitive. And, you know, Igenix says, yeah, the PCR is, is genus specific, so it's broad. You know what I learned in preparing for this, which I never knew, and I've been in practice since <laughs> I hate to tell how long since, I don't know, Igenix does four separate PCRs on their samples. If you send them serum and whole blood, they're going to do a genomic PCR and a plasmid PCR on the serum and a genomic and plasmid on the whole blood. So here, by ordering one PCR and paying for one PCR, you're going to get four different ones. So that's another reason why this is a very good PCR. And again, the recommendations, you know, you're just going to have to consider doing a direct test and an indirect test. Um, and you're also going to have to cover the species. So you want to get immunoblots for both the Lyme Borrelia and the relapsing fever Borrelia, and then the broad PCRs. Now, I'm going to finish this series by talking about something no one's had talked about before, but you know, me being a little bit odd, I thought about it. Um, what about a therapeutic challenge? Here you have these patients who maybe had a history of Lyme that's been okay, and then they've gotten COVID and now they're not okay. Well, how can you tell what's going on? What if you um, gave them some treatment to see what would happen? Well, there have been anecdotal reports that some patients who have post-COVID will respond to a course of the antiviral ivermectin. So, wow. Maybe that shows that, in fact, they did have COVID that was a persistent virus. Well, haha, not so fast. Ivermectin may have antibacterial qualities as well. It's a very distant cousin to the macrolide family like azithromycin. So here, a positive response does not conclusively exclude tick-borne diseases as being there also. In fact, years ago, people were advocating using ivermectin for treating Lyme Borrelia. How about the flip side? What about trying an antibiotic trial? Well, the problem is many antibiotics used for Borrelia also have some mild antiviral qualities, the tetracyclines, the macrolides, and the azoles. Are they strong enough to stop COVID? I don't think so, but they might have enough strength to affect them clinically. What about Babesia treatments? Think about it. Most of these are antiviral, especially those that are based on quinine or artemisia. Plus, you know, the macrolides that commonly accompany them. So that doesn't necessarily work. What about the azole antifungals, the fluconazole and so forth? They're also antiviral. So that makes it com complicated. And finally, many complementary treatments used in Lyme also are both antiviral and or help the immune system. So even trying you know, a course of herbs doesn't always help you figure it out. Um, now, the final thing I wanna talk about with this is how about using antibiotics as a challenge to help your testing become more accurate? How do you like that? What is that all about? Well. There's some who advocate giving the patient an intracellular acting antibiotic prior to doing the PCR because presumably it'll break apart the organisms, the intracellular organisms, and allow them to be detected. Now, a number of people do this, a number of people do not do this. All you have to know is that it's not been validated, so I can't you know, vouch for it either way. It's not something I've ever done, but enough people whose reputation and opinion I trust have advocated for this, so I'm just putting it out there so that now you can say that you've heard of it. Um, now, what about antibiotic treatment before urine collection? Well, there's a Lyme dot blot assay, which is a urine antigen detection test that Igenix has offered for decades. Um, and it's kind of common nowadays, and even back then, to pre-treat the person with antibiotic for several days prior to collecting the urine. Um, it's a common practice, it's been validated clinically, it's been shown in series of, from doctor's office as well as in studies. And the reason why is that it's been found that during a symptom flare, the antigen spillage increases. So what's done here is you'll give an antibiotic to induce a Herxheimer reaction and then you collect the urine. What's traditionally done is 
Urine is collected on three different days, for example, day one, three, and five. And an antibiotic course is given for three days or so, starting on day zero, or you give it an injection of a long-acting antibiotic, such as ceftriaxone, on day zero, and then collect the urine on days one, three, and five. So here, it is a common practice and actually validated to give antibiotics prior to that type of test. And now what about someone who's seronegative? I shown in my own studies and reported this as well as now it's published, that if someone who is seronegative is given a course of antibiotics, in my case, 36% of my patients who were in that situation became seropositive after that treatment. Now, the studies that have been published show that in some patients they're seronegative because the antibodies are bound in immune complexes, antigen antibodies are bound together and testing for serologies will only detect a free antibody. So here by giving antibiotics, if they're effective, the germ load decreases and now the immune complexes release the antigen and well, the antigen, so let's say release the antibodies and now you can detect them. So this has been clinically validated and published. So these are some tricks I just wanted to put out there and tell people who don't know about it and to remind those who do. And I'm done with, this, and you can tell I'm done on time because I'm speaking my usual 100%, 100 miles an hour. But anyway, let's go through the summary before we do the Q&A. So, you know, contemporary clinicians faced with managing an unprecedented mix of serious and potentially chronic illnesses. And all of our skills have to be used to help these patients because it's not always clear whether the person has COVID, post-COVID, persistent virus, tick-borne diseases, reactivated other latent infections, or all of them. So we have to do our best in terms of clinical assessment, take advantage of the most reliable tests around, and hopefully I've given you some information on that tonight. And the news that I broke today, soon we'll have tools to help answer a lot of these questions about COVID immunity. Did the vaccine work? I've had COVID, am I still immune? Should I get a booster shot? Um, which vaccine is better? All these questions now we'll be able to answer once the T cell reactivity assay becomes online and hopefully it's gonna come online soon. It's not my department, I'm not part of the company, I can't tell you. Uh, maybe Dr. Shaw can talk about that later on. Now therapeutic trials have been suggested, but really there's no data to support this. Um, if you wanna try it, again, it's not something that's mainstream, so informed consent, something you really should consider doing. In fact, don't consider doing it, just do it. Um, and as always, if you get information, record the data, tabulate it, share it with everyone, publish it if you can, even if you can't, just get it out there so all of us can share and learn from you because it's how this information is gonna go out. And that finally is it. So, you know, thank you, stay safe, best wishes, and please stand by over the next few weeks when we have more information on this new COVID testing so we can maybe have another webinar or something to help everyone um, take advantage. And that's it, we have about 10 minutes left. so. I'll leave it back Great. to our host. Thanks, Dr. Burriscano. That was excellent. Uh, so real quick, I, I've been asked a few times in the chat box if these slides are gonna be made available um, after, and they will, as well as a, a recording of the presentation. So we hope to have those available on Friday. So just come back to the IGENIX website and you'll be able to see the slides and a recording of the session. So again, if you have any questions, there's a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Uh, so feel free to just enter anything uh, relating to uh, the presentation today on tick-borne diseases or COVID-19. And Dr. Burascano and Dr. Shaw uh, will address those questions. And Dr. Shaw, if you can just make sure to unmute your uh, mic, that would be great. <laughs> okay, done. So the okay, first so question. Go Joseph, ahead. Go ahead. No, I was going to say, lead off. Your, your turn, lead off. So the first question we have here, is, is there currently any discussion around using monoclonal antibodies to Very treat good question. the various Lyme and COVID infections? Go ahead, Dr. Shah. Okay, I think that's an interesting question. Um, I don't know that anybody has tried. Maybe, Joe, you know if somebody has tried doing uh, using monoclonals? Well, what I know is that people have tried using them and at least a very small series, and they did not work. And mm -hmm. if you think about it, why would they work? Here we have patients who maybe were healthy their whole life. They get a tick-borne disease. They become seropositive with an intact immune system with antibodies, maybe all the bands on an immunoblot, 
and they still have the infection. So having right. antibodies alone is probably not enough to control the infection. Mm -hmm. Just my take. Thank you. Okay, I'll, I'll read in the next one. It's kind of a long question, but what is the minimum number of viral particles that are required for illness and symptom presence? Or is it individual because some people have viral susceptibility genes, inflammatory genes, or detox genes, et cetera? Well, you know, that's a question that doesn't have a single answer. And I know that Susan is asking this, I can tell by the question. Um, first of all, the basic principle of infectious disease has to do with inoculum size. Why is it that so many healthcare workers, despite double masking and all the moon suits in the world, still have come down with COVID? Well, their exposure is higher. They have a higher um, inoculum. And so they can tend to be more ill. Those with very low inoculum, maybe those are the ones who have low symptomatic or asymptomatic COVID. So that's one part of it. But on the flip side, you're absolutely correct. There are definitely genetic patterns of patients who don't develop good immunity to this. Um, now that we have some preliminary data from the T-cell testing, and hopefully we're gonna have some type of a immunity panel, which will have a B-cell and T-cell test for COVID, you'll be able to test your patients. And if you find someone who should have an antibody response and a T-cell response, but does not, then you go do some genetic testing and see what's going on. And you know, again, what I said in my last slide, collect some data and let us all know. But there's definitely a genetic component to this, but probably, if not more importantly, is the inoculum size. Now, inoculum size probably has more to do with susceptibility to the initial infection, whereas the genetics and the detox has probably more to do with the, the chronic form. So again, you need to do the testing and let us know. Great. And I'm just going to jump around a little bit in the Q&A window because we only have a, a few minutes. And by the way, any of these questions that we can't answer right now, we will follow up uh, with an answer in the coming few days. Uh, but one question here is, is something that we get asked often is, can you describe the broad coverage assay more clearly? What does it cover? Um, Dr. Shaw, it's something that we get asked repeatedly. Yes. Okay, I can try and answer that question. Basically, this test covers, uh, it looks at IgG and IgM together. It covers uh, for Lyme, it covers all, uh, all the species that we talked about uh, for Lyme immunoblots. So we, it's a broad coverage, as the word says broad coverage uh, of all the species, all the pertinent, uh, all the important antigens. It's just that it will not give you the band, specific band information, just like an ELISA doesn't, but it's very inclusive. In the same thing for TBRF. Okay. Another question, any tips on treating persistent TBRF versus Borrelia? Maybe they mean Lyme. Well, one of the basics that a lot of people will agree to is that you have to start the fundamentals and the, and the basics. You treat the terrain, make the person as healthy as possible. You support their detoxification, their antioxidant qualities, their hydration. I mean, the whole list of things to make someone healthier. Um, because even if you have a Borrelia patient and you give them an appropriate antibiotic, if their terrain is poor, they're not going to respond well or not fully recover. So any type of treatment for any chronic illness um, has to have a combination of the specific treatment and the underlying treatment. Um, in terms of persisting, does one persist over the other? Um, I know from many years ago, um, it was found that some patients who had chronic infection, one person had a pericarditis with a pericardial effusion, uh, was due to relapsing fever. So as far as we know right now, there is a chronic form of both. Um, Hopefully, as more people over time do immunoblotting and broad coverage assays and find out what species are there, if they are relapsing fever species in the chronic patient, um, then that's, that's important to know. But on the other hand, Igenix did a study of over 10,000 um, blood samples, and they found that 27%, I believe, who were thought to have Lyme because they were chronically ill, in fact, had relapsing fever and not Lyme. So the group of relapsing fevers in some cases, not in all, but in some cases, I think can be chronic. Okay, great. Here's a question that is, I don't think it has a, a, an answer yet, but um, any thoughts or guesses surrounding the safety of the vaccines for people with tick-borne diseases? I know there's still some anxiety of, 
of some folks about getting the vaccine and um, Dr. B or Dr. Shaw, any thoughts on that? I think we should both answer that. Um, you know, there's some very simple answer to that. If you're someone who is not in completely great health, um, would you rather have a vaccine with one or two antigens that um, is introduced into your body? Or would you rather have the actual infection where 30% of people who are healthy have lingering symptoms and as much as 87% of people who are not healthy are never the same again? You know, of course, it's kind of um, a hard thing to assess for any one patient. But personally, I would rather someone take the vaccine than risk getting COVID. Um, I've done a lot of at least bench, re you know, book research on the vaccines and I was part of many different panels. And I actually um, like the mRNA vaccine. I personally, and this is just me talking, it's not hygienics. I personally like an mRNA vaccine over the adenovirus vaccines like the Johnson Johnson and Sputnik and all the others, um, because you're introducing one specific antigen, you're introducing RNA, which gets translated and then you make in the RNA. The adenovirus vaccines, they have COVID sequences in the vaccine DNA and that gets into the nucleus, makes our body make mRNA that then makes the spike protein. So I'd much rather not have anyone mess with my DNA and get into my nucleus, just have an RNA vaccine and be done with it. Also adenovirus vaccines have other antigens, the antigens from the adenovirus, and people talk about cytokine storms and the chronic horrible disease that some children have gotten. That's been thought to, not proven, but thought to be from overstimulation of the immune system because of multiple antigens. So again, if I'm gonna do a vaccine and I did get the mRNA from Moderna myself and my wife will get that too, um, I would rather do that than get an adenovirus vaccine. Now, Dr. Shah, do you have any thoughts on this? Uh, I personally like the mRNA vaccine because you're really mimicking what the virus would do that gets translated to the proteins and that's what's vaccinating your body. So based on what we have seen, I think the behavior of the Moderna vaccine is very much like when you get a real infection uh, because some of us did get the real infection and so, uh, the symptoms we are getting after the second dose is very similar but milder than what we had it the first time around. And we'll see how the T cell responses are to the vaccine. Um, we do have some data on, uh, on uh, patients who got infected with COVID that were PCR positive and we had followed them. We want to see what happens after the vaccine uh, we don't have a large population of patients to look at uh, that were COVID positive, naturally infected, but with the, um, uh, with the vaccine, we should be able to get more data. And the patterns are kind of interesting. We can't say much as Joe pointed out, we'll have more information we have once we have analyzed the data. It's not as simple as we would like it. So it's going to take us some time to analyze, look at when did, um, the responses start showing because when we had done the patients, we had seen them showing up for quite a while. And one thing that was very interesting, but again, very, very limited data, there was one patient who was positive for T cells for several weeks, then negative for a while, maybe a month or two, and then became positive again for IgM. I don't know what that means. It's very limited data. We want to see what we are seeing or what we find in the vaccine, either after the first dose, uh, what happens after the second dose, what happens. Um, I think once the data comes out, we'll know better in a, another two, three weeks time. We'll have some preliminary data that we can share with everybody. Great. Thank you. So I think we have time for one more question. Uh, again, we'll follow up with any of the unanswered questions directly. Um, appreciate all the questions and, and all the attendees tonight. Um, so the question is, is one of these tests better for determining if a tick-borne disease infection is gone or no longer present? Well, you know, there is no test for cure. I wish there were, um, but there really is not. Okay. That's an easy answer. <laughs> A lot shorter than my usual answers. <laughs> I think this. just have to go by symptoms, how the patient is feeling. Well, that's it. I mean, 
people who have persistent Borrelia, they have four week cycles, they have migratory things, they have multi-system symptoms. So if someone is still cycling every few weeks and they're having symptoms that migrate, then they're still having an active infection. Great. Okay. Well, thanks again, everyone. I really appreciate your time. I, I know it's late out there on the, the East Coast. Um, it's even getting late here on the West Coast. Um, again, <laughs> thanks, Dr. Burriscano. Uh, My great pleasure. presentation as always. Thanks, Dr. Shaw, for everything you do for Igenix and everything you've done for our, our COVID operation. And again, these slides and the presentation will be available uh, on this Friday. So just come to igenix.com and you'll be able to, to view it there. So until next time, we will see you later. Have a good night, everybody. Good night. <laughs>